nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. In this presentation, I would like to talk about alloy disorder in bulk. And what I want to pose here is sort of a first a question or a riddle. So if we have one atom pair and we consider it a unit cell and then we put it into an infinite periodic system, we know how to compute band structure. So typically you would compute the band structure on a single repeated unit cell and you assume that nothing happens in its environment and it's going to be infinitely periodic and that gives you band structure. That's the formal definition of band structure to figure out what are the states in the system in an infinitely periodic system. That means there is a, it's an infinite crystal and there's no fluctuation whatsoever. So if we do that, then we know how to compute gallium arsenide or indium arsenide dispersions for many materials. Right? This is sort of what we understand. But we also know, right, quote unquote know, that alloys such as, such as indium gallium arsenide or aluminum gallium arsenide or silicon germanium, they do have band gaps, effective masses. They have band structure, but they're not ordered. They're not infinitely periodic. There's a conceptual problem, okay? It's not quite clear how to properly calculate a system that is really disordered and have a concept of band structure which is based on an ordered system. And to me, fundamentally, the question is, on the nanometer scale, when you start to cut these things down, right, and you pack an alloy into a small geometry, how big do you have to make your system that it almost is bulk-like, or when is it looking like a local thing that is completely determined by local properties, rather than looking bulk-like? Because that's, I mean, I don't care so much about bulk materials, right? I want to use these kind of materials on a small nanometer scale, and I want to figure out how important are the details of that? Here in that sense, what does it mean to have a, a disordered cell? So we know how to compute things in a, in a periodic structure like this. And what I'm plotting here is an aluminum gallium arsenide uh, a random cell. And I'm showing you different incarnations of the same um, aluminum concentration. Okay. But as, in the, as you see in this animation, they all look rather different. They are fluctuating, right? They're not ordered. So the question now, in a sense, needs to be, how big do you need to make such a disordered system that you don't see the local order anymore? Right? And if you did that, is all the physics covered? And how does the disorder matter? So this is typically being done in material science with a supercell calculation. And what does that mean? So you take a cell, one sample, and then you repeat it infinitely in all three directions. And then you calculate the eigenstates of this huge system, really out of that central cell that is infinitely periodic, when you try to come up with conclusions. So let's do that. But before we do that, we have to realize that we have a little bit of a problem. Say we do this for silicon, just for argument's sake, and we calculate a band structure in a tiny cell, even tinier than what I'm showing on the bottom left, we would have the conduction band edge that looks like this, right? There's a gamma point, here's an X point, and we understand that in silicon. So if we double the unit cell, we fold the band structure in half we would get the green line instead of the red line. Those would be the eigenvalues of our doubled unit cell. If we double the cell again, we would fold the bands again. 
and we double it again, we fold it again. You know where I'm going with this, right? At the end, we might have a very big cell where K, the original translational K that we used as a description of a single cell, is no longer evident. All we get is a set of eigenstates that are sitting on this axis. And from numerical purposes, we may not be even guaranteed to catch all of these eigenstates. And somehow we have to find a way to unfold this. Unless we are just interested in to find the bottom, right? which is fine too. If we just want to have the bottom of the conduction band, we can pick that out. If we found just the ground state here in this axis, that's fine. And for many purposes, that's fine. But sometimes you like to get the effective mass, which means you need to have a couple of states over to get the derivative of this. All right, so we developed a methodology to do that, to unfold from eigenstates that are just computed here at k equal to zero to get back the whole dispersion. And I'm not going to tell you all the details of the math, but show you that it can be done. So we get back the whole dispersion, but we can now do this also in a sense where we might consider <coughs> systems where there's actually fluctuations in there. So it's not just the ideal system, but maybe there's some disorder in there. That would mean there's some disorder on this dispersion, some, some sort of... Um, error margin, error bar. And the height of that error bar would give us an idea about the fluctuations in the system. So we did that, for example, here in aluminum gallium arsenide. And here is shown a 60% aluminum uh, arsenide, a gallium arsenide case. And what we did here is extract the, or unfolded the band edges in a cell that has a thousand atoms in it, and we compare that to something that's called VCA. It's so-called the virtual crystal approximation. To me, that's sort of the poor man's way to do an alloy. What VCA does, it assumes that I can't handle the disorder of aluminum and gallium, but so I'm gonna average the parameters that I'm describing aluminum and gallium with and I create a new atom, I call it aluminum gallium. So I homogenize the whole system by the parameters derived from aluminum and gallium. That's a very common practice and it's called virtual crystal approximation. So you average the material properties of equivalent or participating atoms and you create, so to speak, a new atom you call it the virtual crystal approximation atom. And if you do that, you find you roughly get the same dispersions, except here at the gamma point, you're getting the wrong gap by some, looks like roughly 20, 30 millielectron volt, which could be significant depending on your application. So here, given this methodology, we can actually start to extract effective masses for example, here at the gamma point, and we can plot those masses out of our unit cell calculation, and we roughly overlap a, a linear disp uh, dependence of the effective mass that points, starts out at 0.067 as a function of aluminum concentration and goes up linearly. So those results sort of make sense. This is sort of a benchmark to see whether we're doing this right. 